Oh God, sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. We come before you together having all experienced a variety of thoughts and of emotions this week. We ask that you would center our affections on your son, the word of God made flesh. Let your words be heralded this morning and let the truth reign over our hearts and over our minds. Let my speech be nothing more than another beggar pointing to where the bread is. Let nothing, not our own thoughts, not me, or anything else get in the way of your spirit's impression of this word on our hearts this morning. We thank you for your abundant care and provision for us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter 16. Verses 14 through 18. Again, that is the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. And if you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, that is, that is totally fine. We have Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. There should be one there. Please, you're welcome to take it and to use it. Open it up there to Luke. If you don't have a Bible at all, please take that as a gift from us to you. We want for you to know God's word, and God's word is where we know in full confidence that life can be found. And as you are turning there, I want you to consider a question along with me. What do you think of the law? What do you think of the law? Is it an annoyance to you and keeping you from doing the things that you want to do? Is it something that you think that you have conquered or at least managed? Is the law something that is offensive to you? That something outside of yourself has the capacity to tell you what you can and cannot do? This morning we are going to consider the topic of God's law, namely what it takes to fulfill it. And we're going to see that God's law holds us to a high standard that must be completely fulfilled. God's law holds us to a high standard that must be completely fulfilled. So if you would... Stand up with me out of respect for God's word as we read the text together, these four verses. Starting in verse 14. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The last time we were in the book of Luke together, which was about a month ago, we read Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and it was on Christian stewardship. What God's word has to say, what a righteous way to spend and to use our money and our resources. That Jesus 
the true king over all things, and the word of God made flesh, is also Lord over the entire law. He tells us what is true, and he applies God's righteous standard with perfect precision. And he had just finished articulating the depths of wisdom regarding money and the proper application of it, according to the kingdom of God. And in the passage before us, we see one of the reactions that people had to his teaching. Here, and in the rest of Luke chapter 16, Luke records a warning about the kinds of people that might look like they are going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven, but who will not be because they will be denied access. Verses 14 through 18 act as kind of an interesting and somewhat confusing transition between the parable of the dishonest manager and the rich man and Lazarus that comes right after it. And the point is vivid. Principles from the kingdom of God clash with the, with the opinions of the Jewish religious leaders. And Jesus speaks boldly of those who think that they can justify themselves and those who think that they are good enough to get into heaven by their own actions. So today we are going to be looking at three points together. That is that the law cannot be self-fulfilled in verses 14 and 15. The law must be completely fulfilled in verses 16 and 17. And that the law has a higher standard in verse 18. So starting with point number one, the law cannot be self-fulfilled in verses 14 and 15. The law cannot be self-fulfilled. Any attempt to look at ourselves and what we do in order to claim kingdom of God status on ourselves based off of what we have done, is going to fail. The Pharisees did not like what Jesus had to say about money. In fact, Luke describes them based off of their moral character, identifying them as lovers of money. Obviously, this has a negative connotation to it. It's not just something about describing their hobbies or something that they, they like to do, but it has a negative thing to it. And the Pharisees hated it. They hated Jesus' teaching because he was calling out their own worldliness and their own love of money and what he was saying and, and how it was supposed to be used in God's kingdom for the glory of God and for the good of others. Verse 14 says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. One, notice how the Pharisees respond when they feel attacked by the Savior. They know that he's right, and they know that they are not able to argue. So what do they do? They try to mock him, and they try to ridicule him. And we often do this too when, when someone proves that we are wrong, and we really don't have anything to say to it, so we kind of resort to degrading their character in our immaturity and in our, our sin against one another and against those around us, instead of responding in a godly way and a humble way to either our sin being pointed out or being proven wrong, we respond in ugly and sinful and sometimes just utterly mean treatment of others. And this is when our sin is pointed out. Brothers and sisters, this is not a biblical or Christian way to respond to our sin being pointed out. Jesus responds to them, and he responds knowing their heart. The sin shows up when something is wrong with the heart. That, that's where this starts. He responds knowing that they do not worship the true God, but that they worship their possessions. Their possessions have taken the place of God on the throne of their life. He responds knowing that they are shifting the focus off of their sin and trying to degrade the one who pointed it out, somehow seeking to lessen the blow of what he is saying, somehow seeking to avoid condemnation. So he gives them a pointed 
warning. Verse 15, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. When he tells them plainly that they are attempting to make themselves right, but that it's not going to work. They are laughing and they are ridiculing, thinking that they are the ones who have it all together. And Jesus is telling them that this is just simply not true. And it's sad yet true that many of our stories, when we as human beings tell them to others, are often about how someone else who is nothing like us has done something that was absolutely nonsensical and just does not make any sense and ridiculous. While those who are like us were the prime example of the right thing to do in this circumstance. And you can see how this kind of thing leads to the same kind of mockery of what the Pharisees are doing. You can see that a demented view of ourselves and how good that we think we are is reflected in what we think about the law. And just a side note, this is one of the many reasons why we need to be committing ourselves to other Christians who can lovingly point out our sin and show us our blind spots in ways that we just are blind to and cannot see. That I need you all to help me see my own sin because I do not want to continuously walk in it. Two, Jesus knows their hearts. Jesus knows their hearts because he is God. Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, truly God and truly man. He says that God knows their hearts. And God is the one who is able to tell them what their hearts are actually like. Notice who is the one who is able to do this in this passage. Who is it? Well, it's Jesus. This passage actually reminds us of who Christ is. Something that we have reminders all throughout the Bible that Jesus is God. That Jesus is able to accurately know the hearts of these people in front of them because of the fact that he is God. Passages like this help us to see the true nature of the Savior. But third, the Pharisees are the ones exalted among men, yet are an abomination in the sight of God. They're the ones who look great on the outside. We looked at their own copies of their own written record. It would not only appear spotless, but it would also appear like they are the highest on the list of heaven. That if anyone was able to get to the top of the ladder, at least from what it appeared, it would have, you would have thought it would be them, right? The problem is, that wasn't true. We'll learn later about why their works are not good enough, despite the fact that they look very impressive. But it's, but it's enough to say now that exaltation from God does not look the same as it does on the surface with others. God knows our hearts. God knows your heart, and he knows my heart. And it is already clear to him that we are sinners in his sight, in open rebellion against his rule and reign, having no hope on our own. Beloved, there is something here about the pressures you might feel in, your current, in our current day. We live in the age of the image. And we feel internal and external pressures to look and to appear impressive. Whether or not that's about our style or about our bodies, about our cars and, and our trucks, our jobs and our status, our house, social media, whatever it is. And you and I can be both challenged and encouraged that God looks at the heart. Challenged because it pushes up against all of the ways that even this very week we have sought the approval of man or that we have sought to justify ourselves in the face of others in order to look more impressive. But also encouraged, because the remedy is not trying harder to be more impressive on our own. 
the remedy is the casting of our cares and our anxieties on the one who is able because he cares for us. As a Christian, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you might not be that impressive. By worldly standards, you might not be that impressive. But the good news is that we are slowly being conformed, transformed into the image of the Son of God. Romans 8.29 says exactly that. As you love and adore the excellencies of Christ, you anticipate what the Spirit is doing in you to make you look more like Christ. In Christ, we are made truly glorious. Is there any better news than that? Another thing is that this shows us the importance of kingdom values. Our view of what is worthy of exaltation and and what is not worthy of being lifted up should be slowly, day by day, being transformed to look more like the way that the Bible speaks about it. If it is true that what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God, then we need to be continuously transformed by the word of God as it is wholly true, seeing his statutes as truly just, having our minds and our hearts and affections shaped slowly, that we would learn to love what he loves and hate what he hates. May the Spirit help us to do just that, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. You should be challenged this morning as you sit and listen to God's word preached. Did the thoughts and the opinions of your heart and mind this week reflect the values of God's word? Or were they more shaped by your own desires or by the ever-changing opinions of your surroundings? You and I would consider the Pharisees impressive if we lived In their day, you can only imagine the kinds of conversations that the disciples had regarding the Jewish leaders, that they saw them and how serious they took their faith, or that they took their religion. And yet we see the stunning reality of the way that our thoughts and our actions and our heart all come together to produce some standard of righteousness. A standard that is wicked and and comes up woefully short. To us, it might look grand. But when you see the whole thing like God sees the heart, it is described as what it truly is. As the, one who, as the ones who claim to be justified according to the law, Jesus reveals that unfortunately they were not. That no one is. No human being can be justified in God's eyes by the works of the law. No human being can be self-justified. Why is that the case? That leads us to point number two. The law must be completely fulfilled. The law must be completely fulfilled in verses 16 and 17. In order to achieve reconciliation with God through the covenant, in order to receive the blessings of God's promise, you must do it all of the way. There is no prize for almost finishing the job. There is no grading on a curve. The only fulfillment of the law is complete fulfillment of the law. And herein lies the problem. The Pharisees are ridiculing Jesus and finding his teaching absurd because they believe that they are the ones who are justified before God that they are the ones who are able to teach with authority on subjects like money and things like these. But what happens if they are not actually justified? What do you do if their own justification of themselves, measuring their works and claiming that their actions are enough to fulfill the law? What if that's just not true? If the standard of succeeding in law-keeping is higher than what the Pharisees described, then their own self-justification is wrong. This is the very point that Jesus is making. 
And he does it by describing how one is brought into the kingdom and the stringency of the law and its requirements. First, you may be wondering, what is the law? When we speak of the law, what do we mean? And it can be difficult because it is referred to in a variety of ways throughout the Bible, depending on how it is being used. The law can refer to the Ten Commandments. It can refer to the covenant given to Moses. It can refer to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It can refer to just general rules and regulations, so law. But it can also be used to speak of the Bible as a whole, like in Psalms 119, when the psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law, O Lord. And in the passage before us, we see Jesus using the law in the second way, in speaking of the covenant given to Moses. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for a one dot of the law to become void. The law and the prophets refers to the time period of the Old Testament when Israel was under the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant given to Moses by God, and its legal demands. It had stipulations, just like any contract that you, that you assign yourself to today has stipulations, things that you have to do. And Later on, he says that these demands can only be fulfilled if they are done in full, that you cannot do only part of it but that the whole thing must be done. And he says that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. The law and the prophets. This might seem to be a little bit confusing to you. How do we make sense of this? It says that the law and the prophets were until John. It seems like this verse might diminish the law, like Like it doesn't matter anymore, but then the verse goes on to say that it's actually really important. The Law and the Prophets was a common way to speak of how the various sections, to speak about the various sections of the Hebrew Bible. The first five books of the Bible were often referred to as the Law, kind of like what we mentioned before. But then you also have the various prophetic writings, the books towards the end of your Old Testament Bible. You might think of books like Isaiah or Jeremiah, or or Micah, or Amos. And when the Bible puts these two together, we understand that to be the books of the Bible included in those genres and the truths that can be summarized from them. Uh, I would understand this to be referring to the Old Testament. And your Bible is split up into two different parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And testament is just another word To get to the the similar idea of a covenant, a a promise, specifically that promise that God made with his people Israel. So the larger first portion of your Bible is Genesis through Malachi. It's much of your Bible. That would be the Old Testament because it is under under this kind of understanding about God's promises to, to his people, to Israel, to Moses, the Mosaic Covenant. By referring to the law and the prophets, Jesus is getting at the entire Old Testament system, what we refer to as the Mosaic Covenant. And this is the promise that God made with Moses in Exodus 19, 1 through 7, about what it would look like for God to be Israel's God and for Israel to be God's people. It talks about the obedience necessary to receive blessing and the warning of disobedience that would lead to the covenant curses. If you want to learn more about that later this week, I encourage you to read Exodus 19, 1-7, and you can see where that leads. And the law and the prophets, being until John, reveals how the Old Testament anticipated what God was going to do for his people in the future. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, is a clear place for us to see exactly this. That the kingdom of God was going to be handed over from the law of Moses to the Messiah of God, to to the Christ, whom we know to be Christ.
Christ Jesus. In fact, like we read earlier in Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 5, we saw a clear picture about what that was supposed to look like in the Old Testament. Live set apart as God's holy people. But we often misunderstand the intentions and the purposes of what God has set in place. Some of which just wasn't simply revealed to us yet. The reality is, we often misunderstand the purpose of the law. And they misunderstood the purpose here in Jesus' day, and we continue in similar kinds of misunderstandings. And Christians have often spoken of the law as being used in three ways in God's word. That the law shows us our sin, that it restrains evil, and that it is a good guide to those who have been given grace. So, so number one, the, the law shows us our sin. The fact that sometimes we don't know something is wrong until someone tells us this is law keeping, like this is what is right, and this is what is wrong. This is what it means to keep the law, and this is what it means to break the law. And God's righteous standard reminds us that we consistently fail to keep it. That is one of the purposes of the law, is to show us our sin. It's to show us that, that we cannot be right with God based off of our own actions. The second use is that the law restrains evil. Now think about what would happen if there were no laws. It would be an absolutely terrifying thing. Law restrains evil because without it, people, we all just do whatever we want. We do what is right in our own eyes. And with lots of people doing what is right in their own eyes, it creates lots of problems where other people are hurt by one another, and it is absolute chaos. So the law restrains evil. But third, the law is a good guide to those who have been given grace. For those who are in Christ, instead of butting up against our inability and in the truth of the gospel, God's righteous standard can become a joy to us and not a burden. Apart from Christ, the law is simply a burden because it is constantly pointing out our sin. But in Christ, it shows us God's standard of righteousness and it can become a joy. It can become a good thing. And in the passage before us, we see a lot of evidence for the first purpose of the law. The fact that the law shows us our sin. Galatians 3 is an incredible argument from God on this very subject. The law was given because of transgressions to point them out and to reveal that a greater solution to the problem must be had. That just if we see the law, it shows us our sin and we're kind of left with, what do we do now? But God never intended for a man to be able to achieve life through the keeping of the law. The law shows us that we are dead, but it has no capacity to give life. But more than that, the law acted as a guardian to keep watch over God's people and to provide a standard of God's righteousness until Christ came. This is Galatians 3, verses 23 and 25. Now, to, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. The law proves to everyone of the wrongdoing that we all commit. It's equivalent to videotapes of evidence that are brought in the middle of a trial to prove the law, to prove that the fact that lawbreaking was done. It's legislation and it's witnesses that stand above us and say, this is what was supposed to be done. And this is what he did instead. It's saying that we caught him red-handed. He is condemned. He knew what he was supposed to do, and he did not do it. God didn't simply give the law so that we would be condemned. He gave it so that there would be no excuse for our sin. That sinners would have their eyes open to the truth that we are in need. That we are in need 
of grace. So Galatians 3 speaks of the law as our guardian, and it does this in the same way that Luke 16 speaks of the law and the prophets. And you can see Jesus saying that this kind of acts like a funnel. It directs sinners to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are intended to be left with no way out except to either continue in our rebellion against God, knowing full well that we are woefully wronging him and, and condemned, or we can respond by joyfully receiving his grace as a gift. Entrance into the kingdom of God has to come through the cross of Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and this is the most that you've ever heard God's word read and dissect, uh, dissected and talked about. Maybe you aren't a Christian. And this is your first time that you've ever donned the doors of a church building. Or in this case, church activity building or gym. If so, welcome. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. We're so glad that you would be able to see us gather in this way and pray that you are warmly welcomed just want to let you know that we take God's word seriously. We do our best to make sense of it and that everyone might know and love what it says. And I wonder if you've ever considered what good rules were meant to do to your heart. Do you see law as something that you should try and muster up the effort to achieve? We're told by every commercial that we see on TV Many of our friends, that, that if you can dream it, you can achieve it. And I'm sure that that has drastic effects on the way that we think about our doing good, specifically before God. Do you see the purpose of God's law as something that if you can just put enough effort into, you'll be able to make do? And you might not be as holy as other people around you, and you certainly make mistakes, but you're not like that one guy that you know that is worse than you. Friend, what we are saying this morning is that God did not give us the law that we might be able to spin it in a way that makes us look good. Or that we could try to complete it. Just try to get a few easy steps in to be right before God with our actions, show him that we can kind of do some of it right. We're saying that God gave us his standard of what is right and wrong so that we might recognize how we have failed to measure up. The law is meant to lead you to Christ. So I encourage you to let God's intended purpose of the law do what he said it can do by acknowledging your sin before him. And by faith, you can have life through Christ, the Son who freely gives sinners like you and I his own righteousness. Galatians also says this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, the nations, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That's Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. So I encourage you to repent and to believe the gospel. Because that's the purpose of the law. To push us to Christ. So the law must be completely fulfilled. As it says quite profoundly in verse 17. There's a better chance of the whole universe being completely destroyed. Just completely disappearing before our eyes. Than for even the smallest portion. The smallest dot the smallest speck of the law to be left undone. For the law to be fulfilled, it must be completely fulfilled. And the reality is, even with the most impressive feat of human goodness, even with the Pharisees in claiming to complete the law, it is not enough because it misses the point. The law was not meant to be tweaked so that we could find a way to claim that we've succeeded in it. The law was meant to show us that reconciliation to God by our own works is impossible. 
We're going to need a better source of righteousness in order to be justified before God. So where can this righteousness be found? Where can this righteousness be found? We'll see this in the next point. An example of a higher standard and the promise fulfilled of a better righteousness. So finally, point number three. The law has a higher standard. The law has a higher standard in verse 18. <clears throat> the regulations of the law are much, much, much greater than we think. Truly fulfilling the law is impossible as broken human beings. Because it's not simply the external commands that we fail to uphold, which we do. But it is the heart that our law-keeping comes from that is flawed, that leaves us condemned. Here we have four verses that make up the section on the Pharisees in chapter 16. Then you have verse 18, which in your Bibles might be put into its own section. But this verse is not detached from the former and must be understood as exemplifying the way that the Pharisees tweaked the law in order to claim that they have completed it. Jesus used verse 18 to show how the law, the heart of the law, condemns the law-keeping of the Pharisees, and it pertains to the topic of divorce. Now, it must be said that the Old Testament had given Israel a category for divorce. In Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, which is, which is uh, where, why Jesus says this was given because of the hardness of their hearts. He says that in Matthew 19, verse 8. And while the, entire, while the eternal law of God is completely righteous and perfect in all that it says, the Mosaic covenant is a specific application to a group of broken sinners. So some of the law of Moses is not just a reflection of God's ideal national standard, but a restraining of Israel's sinful tendencies. This includes topics like marriage and slavery and, and trying to keep them from being too much or trying to keep them from being like the pagan nations around them. This is one reason why we do not believe that the law of Moses should be applied today. But what we do often with laws is we try to keep them outwardly while trying to find a way to still get what we want. We try to technically do what we're supposed to, but it's not because we love the law itself. We just want to try to figure out how to kind of jump through a few hoops and still get what we want. We sidestep the purpose of the law in promoting righteousness. And this is what Israel had done. And this is what we often do too. They had found ways for them to get off the hook on a technicality, yet still use the rules for their own selfishness. And they did this also through the divorce laws. They claimed to be a holy people. But if their spouse did or said something that they didn't like, even a minor thing, or if they found something that they they found someone else that they wanted to be with more, they would use Verses in the Bible to justify leaving their wives for someone else. And we should note that the husbands could do this with the wives, but the wives were not allowed to do this with their husbands. If the wife wanted to divorce her husband, she would have to antagonize him enough to get him to want to leave her in the first place. All of this goes directly against the good standard that was meant to be put into place in in the first place, the goal of the law in the first place was to protect women who would have had no provision if they were abandoned by their spouse. And it recognized that Israel was living in a sinful world with broken relationships and people still needed to be cared for in their midst. All of this contradicted the purpose of the law in the first place and the concept of covenantal love. The steadfast love of the Lord that endures forever is supposed to be reflected in the kinds of covenantal loves that they were supposed to have with one another. In their case, that would have meant 
the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant they had with God, that was supposed to reflect God's love for them, as well as the kind of covenants that they made with other people, the covenants that they made in marriage. And Jesus presses into the way that the Pharisees had found out how to self-justify without having to actually seek righteousness. He says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Any who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So leaving your spouse because you want to be with someone you think is better is sinful. And as an example of how the Pharisees failed to fulfill the whole law of God. If verse 17 is true, and the whole law has to be completed, and verse 18 is true, the Pharisees were actually committing adultery because by their own standard of the law, they actually deserved the death penalty. And Jesus is pointing out this inconsistency, the fact that they were not actually carrying out their own law that they claimed to be justified by. And if this is true, then it presents a real problem for all of us. How can anyone be reconciled to God? Did God just give us this law simply to condemn us and leave us in our own sin? The point of our understanding the law and what its standards include is to better understand where it leads. The law should lead us to Christ. That is its goal. Take Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14, for example. Yes, the law gives us complete confidence that we are dead in our sins. But God made sinners alive in Christ Jesus by canceling the debt of sin on our backs, by taking it on himself and nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. God would not look past the legal demands of the law and his own standard of righteousness. So whatever solution provided within the purposes of God, it would have had to be consistent with his own righteousness, with his own character. Like Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law that was on us, that we could not just avoid. And he did this by becoming a curse for us. He took on flesh and died the death that we deserve so that we might be united to him in his resurrection. He provided a way for us to be made alive together with him, being forgiven of our sins as we are unable to measure up to God's standards on our own. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that a good and holy God who can have no partnership with evil And that proclaims that sin must be dealt with properly. That he provided a way for sinners like us who are estranged from God to be brought near through the cross of Christ. And he did this when we trust in him by faith. Yes, the law has a high standard. And it's a standard that we are not able to obtain. But we have a greater Savior and a great High Priest. So what does the Bible say that we should think about the law? We should see it as a good gift of God that should lead us to repentance. We should see it as unconquerable by our own strength. If you are fighting to be a good person before God this morning, the gospel of Christ Jesus warns you to stop and to rest in the work of Christ. We should be able to see God's standard of righteousness as a delight because of the fact that it is received through Christ. And that should lead us to worship the risen Christ 
for showing us mercy and grace in conquering sin and death and fulfilling the law. I want to end by reading one verse of this wonderful poem by Ralph Erskine. He says, A rigid master was the law, demanding brick, denying straw. But when the gospel tongue it sings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. God's law holds us to a high standard that is fulfilled in Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have fulfilled the law. Every bit of it, all of it. We thank you that you pardon sinners and declare your saints justified by the power of your word and the abundance of your grace. Help us to see your righteousness clearly through the lens of your son. For those who are here and are currently under the burden of law and sin, please convict them in repentance that they might be transformed. They might go from a slave to a child of the Most High. We thank you this morning for the gospel and that you are saving a people of your own possession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.